Well, the Lord be with you. So we've been working through this um, series on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, um, chapters 5 to 7. And the past couple of weeks we were looking at the um, hard topic of adultery. And then last week we looked at um, the discussion about marriage and divorce and remarriage. And um, technically, moving forward in the sermon, Jesus doesn't go to this topic, but I thought since we were focusing on the topics of adultery, we were discussing relationships regarding marriage, I thought this would be a good time to discuss the topic of singleness, to address um, those in the body who may have not been married or are no longer married. And so I'd like to spend some time, and we're going to actually be in 1 Corinthians 7 today, which we, we spent some time last week in 1 Corinthians 7, um, but we're going to look at some of the other text within this chapter that addresses the singles today. So if you'd like to stand with me, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 7 verses 6 to 9 as well as verses 25 to 35. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. Yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. So that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away. But if you want to be without care, he who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord. How he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is Uh, what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. You may be seated. So as I said, um, in 1 Corinthians 7, this is the Apostle Paul addressing the church of Corinth. And they, um, as a church, have a, a lot of different issues going on, a lot of different questions that they've been petitioning and asking the Apostle Paul. And through this chapter, he's addressing a variety of topics. He's talking about the principles of marriage. He's talking about um, how those who are married that are Christians that are married are to keep their wedding vows. He then goes on to um, live as you are called. And then he talks about those who are unmarried and those who are widows. And he just discusses the, um, the pros and the cons cons of these different relationship dynamics. And I think the powerful thing that the Apostle Paul really draws in here for the single is that it's actually a very good thing. See, when we think about singleness, sometimes we don't always value it or view it to be a good thing. But the Apostle Paul 
in verse 7, he actually reveals that singleness is a gift from God. You don't hear that in our society very much. Singleness is a gift from God. Single Christians, therefore, are not second-class Christians. Sometimes we think that there might be something wrong or that we present this stigma in the church for those who are Christian and those who are single. But it's so important that we see this right out of the, out of the gate with Paul, that he is saying that singleness is is a gift, so therefore singleness is not a a punishment or a defect. So if you're someone who is single, and if you're thinking to yourself, what's wrong with me, or is God mad at me? Paul is saying it is not a punishment, and singleness is not a defect. He's saying it's actually a gift, a divine gift given to you by God. So singleness, then, it's not sub-spiritual, but it's also not super-spiritual. That is to say that there's nothing wrong with you if you are single, but you are not better than others because you are single. It's important that we have humility, but that we also are glad and we rejoice in the gift of singleness that God gives his church. And so when we think about some of these um, great heroes in the scriptures, we think about John the Baptist. A man who was single, lived on his own, did his own ministry, and Jesus says this is one of the best men to ever live throughout history. When we think about the one who is writing 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is a man who was single, and he starts to lay out some of the benefits of single life. And then we also think about the greatest example, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, Never married. Jesus lived the single life. And I don't think any of us want to say that there is something wrong with Jesus, right? We don't want to say there was a defect or that God was punishing Jesus because he was celibate. Jesus was single. Paul, John, they were all single and they recognized that it was a gift from God. It wasn't a punishment. It's a gift But of course, there are different types of singles, right? Not every single person is single for the same reason or at the same point in their life. And we see that Jesus addresses this topic uh, briefly in Matthew 19, verses 11 to 12. And I, I read a little bit of Matthew 19, if you remember last week, where he was discussing marriage. And he was talking about how permanent the union was supposed to be. And right after that, the the disciples, they're like, well, maybe it's better than not to be married because we're afraid that we might get stuck in a really bad marriage. And so then right after that point, he goes into this in verses 11 and 12, and he says, but he said to them, all cannot accept this saying, but only those whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. See, so what Jesus is saying here is he's saying that there is an option. Marriage isn't the only option on the table for a disciple of Christ. There is the option, there is the route to be married, but there's also a valid, good option that is to be single or is to be celibate. And Jesus, he, he explains that there are those who are uh, eunuchs from their mother's womb. He then goes on to say that there are some who have been made eunuchs, potentially those who were working with royal women, that they would um, have certain um, things happen to them so that they would not um, have any specific relationships with royal women. So there are those who were made eunuchs by men. And then there are those who actually choose this lifestyle, it says, for the kingdom of heaven's sake. So... Though Jesus gives a brief list, this isn't an exhaustive list. There's many more examples of singles. So what are some different types of singles? Well, I think there are those who probably are in here today that you would call them the the hopeful and waiting, right? We got some people in high school I know here. This doesn't just mean those in high school, right? You can be older and be hopeful and waiting. But 
there are those I know that are planning probably to find a spouse one day, right? That they're, they're single for this period of time, but they, they hope one day the Lord would give them a spouse, right? So we have those who are, those who are in waiting. They are, they are hopeful. They are seeking marriage, but for the time, they are single. They are not married. We also have those who have been divorced or those who have been widowed, right? We have those who may have um, had a marriage end or maybe um, a husband or a wife has passed away. And now they are a single Christian. And it's so important that whenever we address the divorced and the widowed, that, it's, that when we say singleness is a gift from God, it's so important that we make a distinction and we say that the death of a spouse or the divorce itself was not the gift. That can be heartbreaking. That can be hard. There's so many different things that can hurt you and upset you about that. That is not the gift. Singleness is the gift. Not the divorce. Not the death. Singleness. God can bring good out of even bad things. But we do have those who experience singleness for being divorced or widowed. There also are those who may struggle with same-sex attraction or those who may um, have a, a certain circumstantial impairment. Maybe it's um, due to social or physical um, incapabilities. There are those who may remain single for these purposes as well. And then as we saw what Jesus addressed, and then th there are those who could marry but they have chosen celibacy to pursue Christ fully. And I think that's potentially what we're seeing with the Apostle Paul. I think that is what we saw with John the Baptist. Those who said, we want to pursue heaven. We want to pursue the kingdom of God with our entire being. And so therefore, we choose then to be single. So not only is singleness a gift from God that there are different types of groups that are single, but it's important that we remember that not only is it a gift, but it is a good gift. Singleness is a good gift. See, verse 7, it says, For I wish that all men were even as I myself, that is being single, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner, and another in that. It is so important that we remember, if you are in Jesus Christ, and if you are married, or if you are single, that you have a gift given to you of God. If you are married, or if you are single, you have a good gift from God. See, we want to be careful that we don't think that just singleness is good, or just uh, marriage is good, but when we see in Proverbs 18.22, it says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So it's not a bad thing to get married. It can, it's a very good thing. If you find a wife, you have favor from the Lord. But we also see that the Apostle Paul is saying, but singleness offers you some very clear benefits in this life. But before we just go right into some of these other benefits of singleness, it's clear that Paul says that this is offering counsel and not a command. So if you are someone that you're, you're going to hear this today and you're like, you know what, I'm maybe that hopeful and waiting crowd, or maybe I really want to be married, right? Maybe this isn't for you long term or a permanent lifestyle. It's clear that Paul is saying this is not a command. You do not have to remain single. But he says that there is wisdom with choosing the single route. So what are some of those reasons? Well, in verse 28, the Apostle Paul says that he would like those who are in Christ to remain single so that, they, that it might spare them from the troubles in marriage. So you don't always hear that preached, right? The troubles of marriage. There are actually some bad things believe it or not, that happen in marriage. Because here's the thing. Who knows that they're a broken, sinful person that makes mistakes? Now, what happens when you add another person who has different problems, different things going on in their life, and now you put them in a close house, right? They're closed in proximity. And then you start to maybe mix in children who are also very crazy, right? 
can, you never know what they're going to do next, right? There's a lot of these different stressors. There are things that will happen. There will be times where you might hurt one another. There will be troubles in marriage. And then what it does, as we see moving forward in this text in verses 32 to 35, the Apostle Paul says, and what these troubles can do is it actually can lead to an undivided attention. See, when you're married, you have certain obligations, right? You can't just say, I do, and then never talk to them again, never buy them anything, never make sure that they're taken care of, that you feed them, protect them, clothe them, that you um, relate to them, let them know that you have affection and care for them. See, when you're married, you have to spread out and divide your attention, right? You have to make sure that you give time for your family and for your children, right? For your spouse. You have to Give this time, and there are going to be times that you aren't going to do it perfectly. Majority of the time, we aren't going to do it perfectly. And there then will be this divided attention, and there will be these troubles that will happen. There will be fights that are going to happen, and it's going to distract you and give you a lot of attention elsewhere that other than from the kingdom of heaven. And so what Paul is saying here is he's saying that I offer this counsel because if you are someone who can bear this and can receive this gift with your entire life and your entire being, he's saying you will be spared from the potential troubles of marriage, the frustrations, all the difficulties, and you will not have a divided attention. You can have your sole focus on living for and honoring the Lord. Because there are those who are single, and even if you're not single now, you remember what it was like potentially to be single, right? You have a lot more time. I have some single friends that I know that I can call, and they have a lot more flexible schedule. Actually, you know, they those who are single, a lot of times they even have more money because they're not having to spend it on what my wife loves to go to Hobby Lobby or Amazon, right? That All that money starts to go away very quickly. I don't know where it's going, right? Well, when you're single, you know where the money is going, right? So what this is saying is that you can have a clear, undivided focus on the kingdom of God, on the mission for Christ. So what this then provides then is it it provides an opportunity to draw closer to God. That is why singleness is such a good gift. What is the greatest thing that we could possibly have in this world? And that is that we could get closer and know God better. And that's what singleness actually offers. It says your entire life, everything that you do, it's all about let's get closer to God. Get closer to him, get to know him better. That is what singleness offers. However, it's important that I say it it provides an opportunity to draw closer to God. Because just because you're single, that doesn't mean that you're getting closer to God. Just because you're married, that doesn't mean that you can't get closer to God, right? So that's why we have to recognize it is an opportunity, and the question is, are you taking advantage of the opportunity that you have in singleness? Are you so upset or frustrated, or you think that there's something, a defect in you, that you aren't allowing yourself to grow in the waiting, grow in this time of singleness, That is what the gift is. You have the ability to receive God in a much more deep, intimate way than those who are married. And that's what the Apostle Paul is experiencing. He has the Lord with him wherever he goes, and he is seeking closer and nearer to him. So it provides this great gift, this good gift, this opportunity to experience God in a new way. So we see that singleness then is a gift from God. We then see that singles are called to purity. Singles are called to purity. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 18 to 20 it says, "Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body." But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. 
Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, it is important that I, I note that in this text, all Christians are called and commanded to flee sexual immorality. The difference is, in marriage, there is a certain parameter, there is a certain context in which sexual relations is holy and acceptable. But marriage is the only route, that is the only avenue in which you can do sexual activity. So that means if you are not married to your spouse, you cannot be looking at pornography. If you are with your spouse, that is the only person that you can have these desires for. That is why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, those who look or desire after someone who is not their spouse, they have committed adultery in their heart. Any sexual activity outside of the marriage unit is adultery. That is sexual immorality. And so if you are single, that means that your only option is purity to abstain from these acts. So what that means then is temptation is not an excuse for sin. Temptation is not an excuse for sin. Just because so many people in the world today think that it's okay to sleep together when you're not married, that doesn't make it okay. Just because you feel the urge and maybe you think, well, chemically and physically, it just, it makes sense. I have that urge. That's just what my body was made to do. The Bible says flee from that temptation. If you are single, you are called to purity. You cannot allow yourself to embrace the cultural lie that says it's okay to do whatever you want with your bodies. Singleness, therefore, as we see, as they are called to purity, that means that, not, or that singleness is not for everyone. Jesus says this is not for everyone. That those who can accept this, or that the Apostle Paul says that I'm not commanding it, and that those who can hear this, and can accept it. So singleness is not for everyone. And those who recognize that they have these struggles of sexual temptation, they are actually permitted to marry. In verse 9, we see this. Verse 9, it says, But if they cannot exercise uh, self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So if you're that person, you're like, hey, I'm single, I understand it is a gift from God, I'm, I'm trying to rejoice and be grateful for the gift that God has given me at this time, however, I really feel this temptation, I really feel this urge, I am burning in my passion or my desire, I would like to have the relationship that you have in a marriage. Well, if that is you, then it says that you are permitted God is not saying you cannot be married. He says that actually if you are burning or if you are not able to control yourself, then it says you are free to marry. But the thing is, you are still called to purity until that marriage. That's the powerful thing is we have to remember singleness is a gift. Singles are called to purity. And even if you're someone who struggles or deals with self-control, you have to wait until you are married, but you are free to marry if you wish. So we see those two things. The final thing that I'd like to share regarding singleness is singleness is not your identity. Singleness is not your identity. Sometimes when we think about those who are single, those Christians who are in our churches, right? Sometimes all we do is we look at them as someone who is single. Or maybe if you are that single person, maybe that's all you ever feel, right? You're always like, I'm the, I'm the third wheel, right? Or, or I just feel like I, I just need that person or, oh, that poor person, if only they could find a, a girlfriend or, or a boyfriend, right? Or a spouse, right? That is not the way that we are to look at our brothers and our sisters in Christ who are single. Because singleness, just like marriedness, that is not the identity of a Christian. Galatians 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you are a Christian, then that means your identity is Christ. So you're not, oh, I'm single. I'm married. You are a Christian. You are bought by the price from Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We have the Holy Spirit living in us so that we can live a pure life, that we can honor God with our life. Because the thing is, the world wants you to get into all these subcategories. The world wants you to self-identify as a gender, as a race, or a, some type of social status. It wants you to separate and segregate yourself. But what Jesus is saying is he says, I am making all of us one body. You're not white. You're not black. You're not male or female. You're not slave. You're not free. You are all equal. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So that is your identity. If you're trying to find meaning or purpose or identity in your job, in your relationships, you are seeking something that is not your true identity. Christ is our ultimate identity. In John 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we who believe in him, we become a part of the or the family of God. You are a child of God. So what that really means then is that if you are a Christian and you are a single, you are not alone. Sometimes we think, I'm single, so that means I have nobody. I'm all by myself. But that's not what the Bible teaches here. The Bible says you are Christ who bought you. You have the Holy Spirit living within you, and you are a part of the family of God who is there for you. You are never alone if you are a single Christian. You are everything but alone if you are a single Christian. You have the family, you have the kingdom of God on your side. So those who are in Christ are a part of the family of God. And it's so important that we as a church also recognize that not only is singleness a gift for those who are single, but it's also a gift for the church. See, when you have someone who is married, they come with certain life experiences, right? They come with certain things, the way they think, the way they understand things. But when someone comes as someone who is single and has not had these experiences they have had different experiences they have a different perspective if we are called to reach the lost right to all nations there are going to be all different types of people so we need all different types of perspectives and we need to learn how to relate with one another from different dynamics so actually the singles have a lot to teach the marrieds and those who are married have a lot to teach the singles That's why it's so good to have this diverse group of believers on a Sunday morning or whenever we gather throughout the weeks. It's good to share and to be with other people who are not yourself or not always like you because if it's always just you, you have nothing much to learn. But we have a lot to learn from one another as we love, serve, relate to one another. So singleness offers a gift also to the body of Christ. But as we think about singleness and we think about our identity, I think that it's so important that we remember that we cannot view marriage and sex as an idol. Marriage and sex cannot become an idol in your life. And this can be a temptation for our brothers and sisters who are single. They can start to look and they just see the grass is always greener on the other side, right? They see, oh, if I could just have a wife or a husband, everything would be great. My whole life would be perfect if I could have sex and it not be a sin. That would just solve all of my problems. But it's important that we remember that the, this concept of the American dream, right? Where it's, it's about, we get this, you know, this cute little family with two kids, the white picket fence, and it's all about making money and success and getting whatever we can. 
The American dream is not the Christian mission. The Christian mission is to serve the Lord, to share the gospel, to get closer to Jesus Christ every single day. So if that means that it, it doesn't have ever, you don't have a house or you don't have a family with children, you don't have this white picket fence, that's okay. You can still fulfill the, the Great Commission without those things. So the thing is, are you serving and engaging the Christian mission, not being blinded by the American dream? Because marriage, sex, these things, they are not going to solve your problems. If you are someone who is dealing with anxiety, loneliness, depression, anger, lust, if you have any of these things going on, guess what? When you get to the marriage, those things aren't going away. If you have it in your mind, you've bought into a lie from the devil. If you really think that, oh, once I get married, I'm never going to feel lonely again. Are there people who have been married and felt lonely? Are there people that are married that have felt stressed, angry, lost, struggled with addiction, lust? I can say, yes, we all don't get into this concept to think marriage and sex just solves the problem. It doesn't. Actually, that's why we see divorce happen so often. Because people that think marriage is the ultimate goal, that's the God of this world, when we place that as the idol, once they get into it and they look at their spouse and their spouse isn't fulfilling every single thing they thought that they needed, they didn't fill the void of loneliness, stress, addiction, they didn't do all of these things, they start to resent their spouse. Because what they were doing in marriage and sex is they were actually replacing Christ because Christ is the source that we are seeking for fulfillment. See, that is why Christ has to be your identity. See, Jesus is not just an imaginary friend that it's, it's helpful to have every once in a while when things get rough, that you have someone to talk to, right? Jesus Christ is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the God of the universe. And he died on a cross for you. He rose from the dead for you. And now he is seeking and offering an intimate relationship with you. That is what we are called to seek after. Marriage, singleness, all of that is a far second to that which is Christ. We must recognize Jesus is our goal. Jesus is our standard. Now, if you can do that through singleness, great, amen. If you can do that through marriage, wonderful. But make sure that that is the goal and not these secondary issues. Christ is the deepest and most intimate relationship you could ever have. Why would you ever settle for anything that is second best? That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying singleness allows us to reorient our focus to Christ. Jesus is number one in our lives. So that is what we are called to look towards. That is who we are called to cry out for every single day. So Christ is the goal. But if you're in a marriage, we need to remember that Christ needs to be the center of that marriage. So if you're someone that's that single and waiting group, right, or you're that person that's hopeful one day, you have to remember, if you don't get Christ at the center now, you're going to have problems in the marriage later. So that is the ultimate thing is that we need to remember, Christ is key. He is the center of our lives. He is the identity of a Christian. So if you are a single or a married brother or sister in Christ today, let us remember these things, that singleness is a gift from God. It's a good thing. But those who are single, they are called to purity for however, however long they have that gift of singleness. And then finally, we need to remember that singleness is not their fundamental identity. Every single Christian's identity is Christ, is the gospel, what he did for us and what we are called to do in the mission, that is our identity because Christ is the deepest relationship we could ever have. Let us pray. 
Father, we come to you right now. We are grateful for this message on singleness, that we could think about these things and to recognize the great gifts, the great blessings that you give us that we sometimes take for granted, that we sometimes don't view as a gift, that we sometimes don't recognize how good you are. But even through the seasons of waiting, even through singleness, even through marriage, whatever we experience in our lives, you are there, that you love us, that you're good, and that you offer us this deep relationship with you. So wherever we're at, whether we are married or single, that we would seek you out, that we would draw closer to you today, and that we would recognize you are the ultimate source of fulfillment and satisfaction. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.